for that, uh, um, the brain imaging. Thanks, Mark. All right, thank you very much. Um, so I'm actually giving this talk on behalf of S Professor Stephen Smith, who can't be here today, unfortunately. And he and Professor Carla Miller have been the ones who have really been driving the analysis and the acquisition of the brain imaging data. And Fidel Alfaro Magro has been doing huge amounts of work in processing all of this vast amounts of data for us. So I'm going to start with a video showing you the richness of brain imaging data. So we can get all sorts of things. We can get anatomy and volumes of substructures in the brain. We can find out where activity is going on during a task and how things are connected together in networks. We can find out about the wiring of the brain, how it's all connected together. And also I want to give you a sense of how Biobank compares to other brain imaging studies. So in a particular study that an individual might do in a, or a group in a, a lab, you might have up to maybe 125 subjects. That would actually be really quite large. Then there are some publicly available data sets we talked about an, earlier this morning, about 1,000 or 2,000, and then there's Biobank. <laughs> and it's just huge. It's exciting because it's so much bigger than anything that we've had before. And that's really important if we're going to look at rare things, so diseases which are, are really quite uncommon. Um, it's a fantastic resource. And also for looking at other diseases and getting a whole um, range of ages and, and points during the disease process, catching it early. And we can find from this brain data things that we know about, like the hippocampus is one of the substructures and how that relates to things like Alzheimer's. But there's so much more that we can learn because there's a huge amount of data that we can get and that we are acquiring because there are different modalities that you can get from one MRI scanner. And so we actually get a number of different types of images which tell us different things about the structure and the function of the brain. And what makes that even better is that we can then combine it with a huge amount of other information that there is about the participants. The, the genetics, the environmental factors, their clinical histories, and all of that in the age range where we know that these disease processes, if they happen, will be going on and we'll be getting information about how that's happening in the early stages. And then we can look for prospective markers, trying to find out what's going to happen later on, which is really the thing that is hugely useful. And for, in, for developing therapies and for being able to monitor treatments, this is absolutely crucial. So it's a very exciting uh, area to be in. We've got six modalities or different types of images that we get from our MRI scanning session. They include fairly standard structural images, so this is a, called a T1 weighted image and it gives us information about where different of these substructures are in the brain or about the amount of brain volume and grey matter. We get information from a T2 flare sequence about inflammatory areas in the brain and some changes with vasculature. We get susceptibility weighted MRI or T2 star weighted MRI which tells us about iron depositions, iron which gets trapped in some of the cells within the brain which is something that happens in ageing and also some of the disease processes. We also get a thing called diffusion MRI and that tells us all about the wiring of the brain and aspects about the cells which are involved in that, the axons, the bits which connect the brain cells together. We can get information about task, or the function of the brain. What happens when the brain is actually performing a certain task? We can find out where the areas of activity are. And we can find out about actually what's happening during rest, when you're not actually doing a task, but actually what areas of the brain pull together as networks. And that's what we use our resting data for, is to find out what are the connected networks of the brain, not just due to the wiring, but the areas which are actually working together functionally. We squeeze all of this down into 30 minutes, or actually 32, but don't tell the liver guys. Um, and that gives us the ability to get all of these six modalities into that. And the only way that we've been able to do that is by leveraging really cutting edge technology, such as accelerated imaging. And so that cuts down the amount of time that it would take for any one of these particular ones hugely and gives us the ability to get nice high resolution images which show all the details uh, of where things are located, but also get a, a vast amount of data. So the multiband acceleration from the University of Minnesota, which was used in the Human Connectome Project, which we're also part of, has been hugely helpful in get, being able to get this amount of data, this richness of data for us. And just to give you an idea, the resting state data, which is the second line there, six minutes, within that six minute frame, we get almost 500 separate images of the brain that we can analyse to see what the dynamics are of the functional activity which is going on. So we have a huge amount of data which we're actually acquiring in our session. 
And we take all of this uh, brain imaging data and we have to run it through a whole lot of sophisticated processing. And so there's a lot of automated processing which goes on to this brain data, which we've made very robust and reliable so that we can actually pull out the things that we are most care about, which actually come in two varieties. One is the images. So you've seen this before with the, the body imaging. Um, we can get, we are creating images where they store the different bits of information. So lots of different images telling us about what is the, the function occurring at a different location. How is it connected to other pieces, either in the wiring or in the functional connectivity? Where are the delineations of the substructures? Where are the borders of things like the hippocampus? And so this imaging data is hugely important and is very different from the raw data which is coming off. And so that allows people who don't have the expertise in actually processing the raw data to use this data. If they understand the brain, they want to actually get access to that. But we also create uh, imaging derived phenotypes, as was described before. They're, these IDPs coalesce this data down into single numbers. So something like the volume of the hippocampus is a single number which represents all that we would get from the size and shape of the hippocampus from one of these images and represents it as a single number. And that can be used by a lot of people to actually then have very quick access to look at all sorts of relationships between brain and, and other things. And so we cater for people uh, who want to just use that summary information, people who are really interested in location and where things are in the brain with that processing, and probably the, the much smaller percentage of people who are imaging experts and can use the raw data and want to do something maybe a little bit different with that. In terms of what IDPs we actually create, so from the, the structural side of things, which, are the, which these three sequences tell us about, or these three modalities, we can get things like the volume of the, the brain, the volume of the, the grey matter within the brain, which is what I'm highlighting here in the coloured part. We can get the volumes of the subcortical structures, things like the hippocampus or the thalamus or other structures. And we can also summarise within those structures, so say within the, the hippocampus, what is the average of some of the other measures that we get, such as the T2 star from the susceptibility weighted imaging. And then that gives us a number which gives us a, a measure or a surrogate for how much iron there is um, accumulating in those cells. From the diffusion data, we actually have a huge wealth of information about the microscopic structure the microstructure of the tissue which is connecting, the axons which are parts of the brain cells which connect one uh, part of the brain to another. And there's a whole range of different information we can get from those. And for the IDPs, we summarise them by averaging over static um, tracks. So we have these different colour-coded tracks which are sort of standard segments of the wiring which are common across all of the individuals. And so we've broken down that wiring into different areas and we get an average of each of these different microstructures in each of the different areas. But we can actually go beyond that and use the full richness of the diffusion information that we get, which is actually uh, gives us a lot of information about the wiring to come up with very subject-specific areas of how the wiring is done. And these are called tracks. And we get 27 of these different tracks, and we are storing those as images so that you can see where those tracks are for that individual subject, and also ways of, again, creating IDPs by summarising the different microstructures over those particular tracks. In terms of activation and, and function of the brain, we have one particular task that we do, which is the Harari face task, which looks at how the brain processes images of shapes and faces and also emotional content of the faces. And that's a very reliable task that gives us a lot of information um, in different areas which respond to different things. And we summarise that by having images and also being able to extract numbers which give us a sense of how strong the response was to the different parts of, of that task. And this is a task which has uh, been taken directly from the Human Connectome Project so we can link directly into their results as well. I briefly talked about processing before and the, the fact that we have to do a lot of automated processing. Motion within the scanning is a big problem for almost everything, but for resting state, the, the last modality I'll talk about, it's even more of a problem. And so we've done a lot of effort to try and get rid of motion. This is just an example whereby the data on the top line you can see hopefully has some motion, you can see that. And on the bottom line, we've got rid of virtually everything, and it's much, much cleaner 
and we can take that clean data and then extract the networks which are functionally active within that brain. And we can look at either broad networks and a small number of them, which is what we're sort of summarizing in the, the top right corner with that matrix, where each element in the matrix tells us how one network is connected to another, how much they share information. And or we can pull down even more detailed information and drill down into where these different networks split up, and that's what we're showing at the bottom. And again, we're storing information in the forms of images, but also in the forms of IDPs, because each of those elements in that color-coded matrix at the top forms an individual IDP, or a single number. And for each of the IDPs, through the Biobank website, you can see the statistical distributions of those. And this was an example from the, the first release where we had about 4,500 individuals. We've now got 6,000. But we can go beyond that, and we're interested in normative modeling. So the equivalent to this is sort of infant growth charts, to know at a particular age what is typical, what kind of range is normal. And so we are trying to create these. So this is just an example where we picked some IDPs which are specifically are known to be associated with Alzheimer's disease and create this kind of normative models uh, for them, which is a hugely useful um, and valuable resource, both research and clinically. It will be really helpful. And then the last thing I'll talk about is just something that, that we've done recently in terms of looking at age and how that affects a particular microstructure called FA. And you can see in the blue areas where that's actually decreasing with age, which is the standard thing that's known. And then in areas in red where it's actually increasing, which is due to a complex geometry where you've actually got fibre pathways which cross over each other. And the location of those is different in different individuals. And so the only way that you get good access to knowing what that is like is by using the image data and actually going back to that rather than looking at the IDPs. So there's a huge amount of rich data which we're getting out and we can analyse now, both in the forms of images and IDPs. And so with that, I'll finish and just again thank Stephen Smith, Carla Miller, who've really been driving the science here, and Fidel, who's been doing huge amounts of work in getting all the pipelines working. Thank you.